Chapters 31 and 32 of John Barleycorn or Alcoholic Memoirs by Jack London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 31 but the same stimulus to the human organism will not continue to produce the same response. By and by, I discovered there was no kick at all in one cocktail. One cocktail left me dead. There was no glow, no laughter tickle. Two or three cocktails were required to produce the original effect of one and I wanted that effect. I drank my first cocktail at 11.30 when I took the morning's mail into the hammock, and I drank my second cocktail an hour later just before I ate. I got into the habit of crawling out of the hammock ten minutes earlier so as to find time and decency for two more cocktails ere I ate. This became schedule. Three cocktails in the hour that intervened between my desk and dinner. And these are two of the deadliest drinking habits. Regular drinking and solitary drinking. I was always willing to drink when anyone was around. I drank by myself when no one was around. Then I made another step. When I had for a guest a man of limited drinking caliber, I took two drinks to his one, one drink with him, the other drink without him, and of which he did not know. I stole that other drink, and worse than that, I began the habit of drinking alone when there was a guest, a man, a comrade, with whom I could have drunk. But John Barleycorn furnished the extenuation. It was a wrong thing to trip a guest up with excess of hospitality and get him drunk. If I persuaded him, with his limited caliber, into drinking up with me, I'd surely get him drunk. What could I do but steal that every second drink, or else deny myself the kick equivalent to what he got out of half the number? Please remember, as I recite this development of my drinking, that I am no fool, no weakling. As the world measures such things, I am a success. I dare to say a success more conspicuous than the success of the average successful man, and a success that required a pretty fair amount of brains and willpower. My body is a strong body. It has survived where weaklings died like flies. And yet these things which I am relating happened to my body and to me. I am a fact. My drinking is a fact. My drinking is a thing that has happened, and is not theory nor speculation. And as I see it, it but lays the emphasis on the power of John Barleycorn. A savagery that we still permit to exist, a deadly institution that lingers from the mad old brutal days and that takes its heavy toll of youth and strength and high spirit and of very much of all of the best we breed. To return, after a boisterous afternoon in the swimming pool, followed by a glorious ride on horseback over the mountains or up or down the valley of the moon i found myself so keyed and splendid that i desired to be more highly keyed to feel more splendid 
I knew the way. A cocktail before supper was not the way. Two or three, at the very least, was what was needed. I took them. Why not? It was living. I had always dearly loved to live. This also became part of the daily schedule. Then, too, I was perpetually finding excuses for extra cocktails. It might be the assembling of a particularly jolly crowd, a touch of anger against my architect, or against a thieving stone mason working on my barn, the death of my favorite horse in a barbed wire fence, or news of good fortune in the morning mail from my dealings with editors and publishers. It was immaterial what the excuse might be. Once the desire had germinated in me, the thing was, I wanted alcohol. At last, after a score and more of years of dallying and of not wanting, now I wanted it. And my strength was my weakness. I required two, three, or four drinks to get an effect commensurate with the effect the average man got out of one drink. One rule I observed. I never took a drink until my day's work of writing a thousand words was done. And, when done, the cocktails reared a wall of inhibition in my brain between the day's work done and the rest of the day of fun to come. My work ceased from my consciousness. No thought of it flickered in my brain till next morning at nine o'clock when I sat at my desk and began my next thousand words. This was a desirable condition of mind to achieve. I conserved my energy by means of this alcoholic inhibition. John Barleycorn was not so black as he was painted. He did a fellow many a good turn, and this was one of them. And I turned out work that was healthful and wholesome and sincere. It was never pessimistic. The way of life I had learned in my long sickness. I knew the illusions were right, and I exalted the illusions. Oh, I still turn out the same sort of work stuff that is clean, alive, optimistic, and that makes toward life. And I am always assured by the critics of my superabundant and abounding vitality, and of how thoroughly I am deluded by these very illusions I exploit. And while on this digression, let me repeat the question I have repeated to myself ten thousand times. Why did I drink? What need was there for it? I was happy. Was it because I was too happy? I was strong. Was it because I was too strong? Did I possess too much vitality? I don't know why I drank. I cannot answer though I can voice the suspicion that ever grows in me. I had been in too familiar contact with John Barleycorn through too many years. A left-handed man, by long practice, can become a right-handed man. Had I, a non-alcoholic, by long practice, become an alcoholic? I was so happy. I had won through my long sickness to the satisfying love of woman. I earned more money with less endeavor. I glowed with health. I slept like a babe. I continued to write successful books, 
and in sociological controversy i saw my opponents confuted with the facts of the times that daily reared new buttresses to my intellectual position from day's end to day's end i never knew sorrow disappointment nor regret i was happy all the time life was one unending song i begrudged the very hours of blessed sleep because by that much was i robbed of the joy that would have been mine had i remained awake and yet i drank and john barleycorn all unguessed by me was setting the stage for a sickness all his own the more i drank the more i was required to drink to get an equivalent effect when i left the valley of the moon and went to the city and dined out a cocktail served at table was a wan and worthless thing there was no pre-dinner kick in it on my way to dinner i was compelled to accumulate the kick two cocktails three and if i met some fellows four or five or six it didn't matter within several once i was in a rush i had no time decently to accumulate the several drinks a brilliant idea came to me i told the barkeeper to mix me a double cocktail thereafter whenever i was in a hurry i ordered double cocktails it saved time one result of this regular heavy drinking was to jade me my mind grew so accustomed to spring and liven by artificial means that without artificial means it refused to spring and liven alcohol became more and more imperative in order to meet people in order to become sociably fit i had to get the kick and the hit of the stuff the crawl of the maggots the genial brain glow the laughter tickle the touch of devilishness and sting the smile over the face of things ere i could join my fellows and make one with them another result was that john barleycorn was beginning to trip me up he was thrusting my long sickness back upon me inveigling me into again pursuing truth and snatching her veils away from her tricking me into looking reality stark in the face but this came on gradually my thoughts were growing harsh again though they grew harsh slowly sometimes warning thoughts crossed my mind where was this steady drinking leading but trust john barleycorn to silence such questions come on and have a drink and i'll tell you all about it is his way and it works for instance the following is a case in point and one which john barleycorn never wearied of reminding me i had suffered an accident which required a ticklish operation one morning a week after i had come off the table i lay on my hospital bed weak and weary the sunburn of my face what little of it could be seen through a scraggly growth of beard had faded to a sickly yellow my doctor stood at my bedside on the verge of departure he glared disapprovingly at the cigarette i was smoking that's what you ought to quit he lectured it will get you in the end look at me i looked he was about my own age broad-shouldered deep-chested 
eyes sparkling and ruddy-cheeked with health a finer specimen of manhood one would not ask i used to smoke he went on cigars but i gave even them up and look at me the man was arrogant and rightly arrogant with conscious well-being and within a month he was dead it was no accident half a dozen different bugs of long scientific names had attacked and destroyed him the complications were astonishing and painful and for days before he died the screams of agony of that splendid manhood could be heard for a block around he died screaming you see said john barleycorn he took care of himself he even stopped smoking cigars and that's what he got for it pretty rotten eh but the bugs will jump there's no forfending them your magnificent doctor took every precaution yet they got him when the bug jumps you can't tell where it will land it may be you look what he missed will you miss all i can give you only to have a bug jump on you and drag you down there is no equity in life it's all a lottery but i put the lying smile on the face of life and laugh at the facts smile with me and laugh you'll get yours in the end but in the meantime laugh it's a pretty dark world i illuminate it for you it's a rotten world when things can happen such as happened to your doctor there's only one thing to do take another drink and forget it and of course i took another drink for the inhibition that accompanied it i took another drink every time john barleycorn reminded me of what had happened yet i drank rationally intelligently i saw to it that the quality of the stuff was of the best i sought the kick and the inhibition and avoided the penalties of poor quality and of drunkenness it is to be remarked in passing that when a man begins to drink rationally and intelligently that he betrays a grave symptom of how far along the road he has travelled but i continued to observe my rule of never taking my first drink of the day until the last word of my thousand words was written on occasion however i took a day's vacation from my writing at such times since it was no violation of my rule i didn't mind how early in the day i took that first drink and persons who have never been through the drinking game wonder how the drinking habit grows chapter thirty two when the snark sailed on her long cruise from san francisco there was nothing to drink on board or rather we were all of us unaware that there was anything to drink nor did we discover it for many a month this sailing with a dry boat was malice aforethought on my part i had played john barleycorn a trick and it showed that i was listening ever so slightly to the faint warnings that were beginning to arise in my consciousness of course i veiled the situation to myself and excused myself to john barleycorn and i was very scientific about it i said that i would drink only while in ports during the dry sea stretches my system would be cleansed of the alcohol that soaked it 
so that when I reached the port I should be in shape to enjoy John Barleycorn more thoroughly. His bite would be sharper, his kick keener, and more delicious. We were twenty-seven days on the traverse between San Francisco and Honolulu. After the first day out, the thought of a drink never troubled me. This I take to show how intrinsically I am not an alcoholic. Sometimes, during the traverse, looking ahead and anticipating the delightful Lane luncheons and dinners of Hawaii, I had been there a couple of times before, I thought, naturally, of the drinks that would precede those meals. I did not think of those drinks with any yearning, with any irk at the length of the voyage. I merely thought they would be nice and jolly, part of the atmosphere of a proper meal. Thus, once again, I proved to my complete satisfaction that I was John Barleycorn's master. I could drink when I wanted, refrain when I wanted. Therefore, I would continue to drink when I wanted. Some five months were spent in the various islands of the Hawaiian group. Being ashore, I drank. I even drank a bit more than I had been accustomed to drink in California prior to the voyage. The people of Hawaii seemed to drink a bit more, on the average, than the people in more temperate latitudes. I do not intend the pun, and can awkwardly revise the statement to latitudes more remote from the equator. Yet Hawaii is only subtropical. The deeper I got into the tropics, the deeper I found men drank, the deeper I drank myself. From Hawaii we sailed for the Marquesas. The Traverse occupied sixty days. For sixty days we never raised land a sail nor a steamer smoke. But early in those sixty days the cook, giving an overhauling to the galley, made a find. Down in the bottom of a deep locker he found a dozen bottles of Angelica and Muscatel. These had come down from the kitchen cellar of the ranch, along with the home-preserved fruits and jellies. Six months in the galley heat had affected some sort of a change in the thick sweet wine. Branded it, I imagine. I took a taste. Delicious! And thereafter, once each day, at twelve o'clock, after our observations were worked up, and the snark's position charted, I drank half a tumbler of the stuff. It had a rare kick to it. It warmed the cockles of my geniality and put a fairer face on the truly fair face of the sea. Each morning, below, sweating out my thousand words, I found myself looking forward to that twelve o'clock event of the day. The trouble was, I had to share the stuff, and the length of the traverse was doubtful. I regretted that there were not more than a dozen bottles, and when they were gone, I even regretted that I had shared any of it. I was thirsty for the alcohol, and eager to arrive in the Marquesas. So it was that I reached the Marquesas the possessor of a real man's size thirst. And in the Marquesas were several white men, a lot of sickly natives, much magnificent scenery, plenty of trade rum, and immense quantity of absinthe, but neither whiskey nor gin. 
the trade rum scorched the skin off one's mouth. I know, because I tried it. But I had ever been plastic, and I accepted the absinthe. The trouble with the stuff was that I had to take such inordinate quantities in order to feel the slightest effect. From the Marquesas I sailed with sufficient absinthe in ballast to last me to Tahiti, where I outfitted with scotch and American whiskey, and thereafter there were no dry stretches between ports. But please do not misunderstand. There was no drunkenness, as drunkenness is ordinarily understood. No staggering and rolling around, no befuddlement of the senses. The skilled and seasoned drinker, with a strong constitution, never descends to anything like that. He drinks to feel good, to get a pleasant jingle, and no more than that. The things he carefully avoids are the nausea of over-drinking the after-effect of over-drinking, the helplessness and loss of pride of over-drinking. What the skilled and seasoned drinker achieves is a discreet and canny semi-intoxication, and he does it by the twelve-month around without any apparent penalty. There are hundreds of thousands of men of this sort in the United States today, in clubs, hotels, and in their own homes, men who are never drunk and who, though most of them will indignantly deny it, are rarely sober, and all of them fondly believe, as I fondly believed, that they are beating the game. On the sea stretches I was fairly abstemious, but ashore I drank more. I seemed to need more anyway in the tropics. This is a common experience, for the excessive consumption of alcohol in the tropics by white men is a notorious fact. The tropics is no place for white-skinned men. Their skin pigment does not protect them against the excessive white light of the sun. The alternate violet rays and other high velocity and invisible rays from the upper end of the spectrum rip and tear through their tissues, just as the X-ray ripped and tore through the tissues of so many experimenters before they learned the danger. White men in the tropics undergo radical changes of nature. They become savage, merciless. They commit monstrous acts of cruelty that they would never dream of committing in their original temperate climate. They become nervous, irritable, and less moral. And they drink as they never drank before. Drinking is one form of the many forms of degeneration that set in when white men are exposed too long to too much white light. The increase of alcoholic consumption is automatic. The tropics is no place for a long sojourn. They seem doomed to die anyway, and the heavy drinking expedites the progress. They don't reason about it, they just do it. The sun sickness got me, despite the fact that I had been in the tropics only a couple of years. I drank heavily during this time, but right here I wish to forestall misunderstanding. The drinking was not the cause of the sickness, nor of the abandonment of the voyage. I was strong as a bull, and for many months I fought the sun sickness that was ripping and tearing my surface and nervous tissues to pieces. 
all through the New Hebrides and the Solomons and up among the atolls on the line during this period under a tropic sun rotten with malaria and suffering from a few minor afflictions such as biblical leprosy with the silvery skin i did the work of five men to navigate a vessel through the reefs and shoals and passages and unlighted coasts of the coral seas is a man's work in itself i was the only navigator on board there was no one to check me up on the working out of my observations nor with whom i could advise in the ticklish darkness among uncharted reefs and shoals and i stood all watches there was no seaman on board whom i could trust to stand a mate's watch i was mate as well as captain twenty-four hours a day were the watches i stood at sea catching catnaps when i might third i was doctor and let me say right here that the doctor's job in the snark at that time was a man's job all on board suffered from malaria the real tropical malaria that can kill in three months all on board suffered from perforating ulcers and from the maddening itch of ngari ngari a japanese cook went insane from his too numerous inflictions one of my polynesian sailors lay at death's door with black water fever oh yes it was a full man's job and i dosed and doctored and pulled teeth and dragged my patience through mild little things like tomaine poisoning fourth i was a writer i sweated out my thousand words a day every day except when the shock of fever smote me or a couple of nasty squalls smote the snark in the morning fifth i was a traveller and a writer eager to see things and to gather material into my notebooks and sixth i was master and owner of the craft that was visiting strange places where visitors are rare and where visitors are made much of so here i had to hold up the social end entertain on board be entertained ashore by planters traders governors captains of war vessels kinky-headed cannibal kings and prime ministers sometimes fortunate enough to be clad in cotton shifts of course i drank i drank with my guests and hosts also i drank by myself doing the work of five men i thought entitled me to drink alcohol was good for a man who overworked i noted its effect on my small crew when breaking their backs and hearts at heaving up anchor in forty fathoms they knocked off gasping and trembling at the end of half an hour and had new life put into them by stiff jolts of rum they caught their breaths wiped their mouths and went to it again with a will and when we careened the snark and had to work in the water to our necks between shocks of fever i noted how raw trade rum helped the work along and here again we come to another side of many-sided john barleycorn on the face of it he gives something for nothing where no strength remains he finds new strength the wearied one rises to greater effort for the time being there is an actual accession of strength i remember passing coal on an ocean steamer through eight days of hell during which time we coal passers were kept to the job by being fed with whiskey we toiled half drunk all the time and without the whiskey we could not have passed the coal 
This strength John Barleycorn gives is not fictitious strength, it is real strength, but it is manufactured out of the sources of strength, and it must ultimately be paid for and with interest. But what weary human will look so far ahead? He takes this apparently miraculous accession of strength at its face value, and many an overworked business and professional man, as well as a harried common laborer, has traveled John Barleycorn's death road because of this mistake. End of chapter 32 Chapter 33 I went to Australia to go into hospital and get tinkered up, after which I planned to go on with the voyage. And during the long weeks I lay in hospital, from the first day I never missed alcohol. I never thought about it. I knew I should have it again when I was on my feet. But when I regained my feet, I was not cured of my major afflictions. Naaman's silvery skin was still mine. The mysterious sun-sickness, which the experts of Australia could not fathom, still ripped and tore my tissues. Malaria still festered in me and put me on my back in shivering delirium at the most unexpected moments, compelling me to cancel a double lecture tour which had been arranged. So I abandoned the snark voyage and sought a cooler climate. The day I came out of hospital I took up drinking again as a matter of course. I drank wine at meals. I drank cocktails before meals. I drank scotch highballs when anybody I chanced to be with was drinking them. I was so thoroughly the master of John Barleycorn, I could take up with him or let go of him whenever I pleased, just as I had done all my life. After a time, for cooler climate, I went down to southernmost Tasmania in 43 South, and I found myself in a place where there was nothing to drink. It didn't mean anything. I didn't drink. It was no hardship. I soaked in the cool air, rode horseback, and did my thousand words a day, save when the fever shock came in the morning. And for fear that the idea may still lurk in some minds that my preceding years of drinking were the cause of my disabilities, I here point out that my Japanese cabin boy, Nakata, still with me, was rotten with fever, as was Charmian, who, in addition, was in the slough of a tropical neurasthenia that required several years of temperate climates to cure, and that neither she nor Nakata drank or ever had drunk. When I returned to Hobart Town, where drink was obtainable, I drank as of old. The same when I arrived back in Australia. On the contrary, when I sailed from Australia on a tramp steamer commanded by an abstemious captain, I took no drink along and had no drink for the forty-three days' passage. Arrived in Ecuador squarely under the equatorial sun where the humans were dying of yellow fever, smallpox, and the plague, I promptly drank again, every drink of every sort that had a kick in it. I caught none of these diseases, neither did Charmian nor Nakata, who did not drink. Enamored of the tropics, despite the damage done me, I stopped in various places, and was a long while getting back to the splendid, temperate climate of California. I did my thousand words a day, traveling or stopping over, suffered my last faint fever shock, 
saw my silvery skin vanish and my sun-torn tissues healthily knit again and drank as a broad-shouldered chesty man may drink chapter thirty four back on the ranch in the valley of the moon i resumed my steady drinking my program was no drink in the morning first drink time came with the completion of my thousand words then between that and the midday meal were drinks numerous enough to develop a pleasant jingle again in the hour preceding the evening meal i developed another pleasant jingle nobody ever saw me drunk for the simple reason that i never was drunk but i did get a jingle twice each day and the amount of alcohol i consumed every day if loosed in the system of one unaccustomed to drink would have put such a one on his back and out it was the old proposition the more i drank the more i was compelled to drink in order to get an effect the time came when cocktails were inadequate i had neither the time in which to drink them nor the space to accommodate them whiskey had a more powerful jolt it gave quicker action with less quantity bourbon or rye or cunningly aged blends constituted the pre-midday drinking in the afternoon it was scotch and soda my sleep always excellent now became not quite so excellent i had been accustomed to read myself back asleep when i chanced to awake but now this began to fail me when i had read two or three of the small hours away and was as wide awake as ever i found that a drink furnished the soporific effect sometimes two or three drinks were required so short a period of sleep then intervened before early morning rising that my system did not have time to work off the alcohol as a result i awoke with mouth parched and dry with a slight heaviness of head and with a mild nervous palpitation in the stomach in fact i did not feel good i was suffering from the morning sickness of the steady heavy drinker what i needed was a pick-me-up a bracer trust john barleycorn once he has broken down a man's defences so it was a drink before breakfast to put me right for breakfast the old poison of the snake that has bitten one another custom began at this time was that of the pitcher of water by the bedside to furnish relief to my scorched and sizzling membranes i achieved a condition in which my body was never free from alcohol nor did i permit myself to be away from alcohol if i travelled to out-of-the-way places i declined to run the risk of finding them dry i took a quart or several quarts along in my grip in the past i had been amazed by other men guilty of this practice now i did it myself unblushingly and when i got out with the fellows i cast all rules by the board i drank when they drank what they drank and in the same way as they drank i was carrying a beautiful alcoholic conflagration around with me the thing fed on its own heat and flamed the fiercer there was no time in all my waking time that i didn't want a drink i began to anticipate the completion of my daily thousand words by taking a drink when only five hundred words were written it was not long until i prefaced the beginning of the thousand words with a drink 
The gravity of this I realized too well. I made new rules. Resolutely, I would refrain from drinking until my work was done. But a new and most diabolical complication arose. The work refused to be done without drinking. It just couldn't be done. I had to drink in order to do it. I was beginning to fight now. I had the craving at last, and it was mastering me. I would sit at my desk and dally with pad and pen, but words refused to flow. My brain could not think the proper thoughts, because continually it was obsessed with the one thought that across the room in the liquor cabinet stood John Barleycorn. When, in despair, I took my drink, at once my brain loosened up and began to roll off the thousand words. In my townhouse in Oakland, I finished the stock of liquor and willfully refused to purchase more. It was no use, because, unfortunately, there remained in the bottom of the liquor cabinet a case of beer. In vain I tried to write. Now beer is a poor substitute for strong waters. Besides, I didn't like beer. Yet all I could think of was that beer so singularly accessible in the bottom of the cabinet. Not until I had drunk a pint of it did the words begin to reel off, and the thousand were reeled off to the tune of numerous pints. The worst of it was that the beer caused me severe heartburn, but despite the discomfort I soon finished off the case. The liquor cabinet was now bare. I did not replenish it. By truly heroic perseverance, I finally forced myself to write the daily thousand words without the spur of John Barleycorn. But all the time I wrote, I was keenly aware of the craving for a drink. And as soon as the morning's work was done, I was out of the house and away downtown to get my first drink. Merciful goodness! If John Barleycorn could get such sway over me, a non-alcoholic, what must be the sufferings of the true alcoholic, battling against the organic demands of his chemistry while those closest to him sympathize little, understand less, and despise and deride him. Chapter 35 But the freight has to be paid. John Barleycorn began to collect, and he collected not so much from the body as from the mind. The old long sickness which had been purely an intellectual sickness, recrudesced. The old ghosts, long laid, lifted their heads again. But they were different and more deadly ghosts. The old ghosts, intellectual in their inception, had been laid by a sane and normal logic. But now they were raised by the white logic of John Barleycorn, and John Barleycorn never lays the ghosts of his raising. For this sickness of pessimism caused by drink, one must drink further in quest of the anodyne that John Barleycorn promises, but never delivers. How to describe this white logic to those who have never experienced it. It is perhaps better first to state how impossible such a description is. Take Hashish Land, for instance, 
the land of enormous extensions of time and space. In past years I have made two memorable journeys into that far land. My adventures there are seared in sharpest detail on my brain. Yet I have tried vainly, with endless words, to describe any tiny particular phase to persons who have not traveled there. I use all the hyperbole of metaphor and tell what centuries to time and profounds of unthinkable agony and horror can obtain in each interval of all the intervals between the notes of a quick jig played quickly on the piano. I talk for an hour, elaborating that one phase of hashish land, and at the end I have told them nothing. And when I cannot tell them this one thing of all the vastness of terrible and wonderful things, I know I have failed to give them the slightest concept of hashish land. But let me talk with some other traveler in that weird region, and at once am I understood. A phrase, a word, conveys instantly to his mind what hours of words and phrases could not convey to the mind of the non-traveler. So it is with John Barleycorn's realm where the white logic reigns. To those untraveled there, the traveler's account must always seem unintelligible and fantastic. At the best, I may only beg of the untraveled ones to strive to take on faith the narrative I shall relate. For there are fatal intuitions of truth that reside in alcohol. Philip Sober vouches for Philip Drunk in this matter. There seem to be various orders of truth in this world. Some sorts of truth are truer than others. Some sorts of truth are lies, and these sorts are the very ones that have the greatest use value of life that desires to realize and live. At once, O oh, untraveled reader, you see how lunatic and blasphemous is the realm I am trying to describe to you in the language of John Barleycorn's tribe. It is not the language of your tribe, all of whose members resolutely shun the roads that lead to death and tread only the roads that lead to life. For there are roads and roads, and of truth there are orders and orders. But have patience, at least, through what seems no more than verbal yammerings, you may, perchance, glimpse faint far vistas of other lands and tribes. Alcohol tells truth, but its truth is not normal. What is normal is healthful. What is healthful tends towards life. Normal truth is a different order and a lesser order of truth. Take a dray horse. Through all the vicissitudes of its life, from first to last, somehow, in unguessably dim ways, it must believe that life is good, that the drudgery in harness is good, that death no matter how blind, instinctively apprehended, is a dread giant, that life is beneficent and worth while, that, in the end, with fading life, it will not be knocked about and beaten and urged beyond its sprained and spavined best. That old age, even, is decent, dignified, and valuable, though old age means a ribby scarecrow in a hawker's cart, stumbling a step to every blow, stumbling dizzily on through merciless servitude and slow disintegration to the end. The end, 
the apportionment of its parts of its subtle flesh its pink and springy bone its juices and ferments and all the sensateness that informed it to the chicken farm the hide house the glue rendering works and the bone meal fertilizer factory to the last stumble of its stumbling end this dray horse must abide by the mandates of the lesser truth that is the truth of life and that makes life possible to persist this dray horse like all other horses like all other animals including man is life blinded and sense struck it will live no matter what the price the game of life is good though all of life may be hurt and though all lives lose the game in the end this is the order of truth that obtains not for the universe but for the live things in it if they for a little space will endure ere they pass this order of truth no matter how erroneous it may be is the sane and normal order of truth the rational order of truth that life must believe in order to live to man alone among the animals has been given the awful privilege of reason man with his brain can penetrate the intoxicating show of things and look upon the universe brazen with indifference toward him and his dreams he can do this but it is not well for him to do it to live and live abundantly to sting with life to be alive which is to be what he is it is good that man be life-blinded and sense-struck what is good is true and this is the order of truth lesser though it be that man must know and guide his actions by with unswerving certitude that it is absolute truth and that in the universe no other order of truth can obtain it is good that man should accept at face value the cheats of sense and snares of flesh and through the fogs of sentiency pursue the lures and lies of passion it is good that he shall see neither shadows nor futilities nor be appalled by his lusts and rapacities and man does this countless men have glimpsed that other and truer order of truth and recoiled from it countless men have passed through the long sickness and lived to tell of it and deliberately to forget it to the end of their days they lived they realized life for life is what they were they did right and now comes john barleycorn with the curse he lays upon the imaginative man who is lusty with life and desire to live john barleycorn sends his white logic the argent messenger of truth beyond truth the antithesis of life cruel and bleak as interstellar space pulseless and frozen as absolute zero dazzling with the frost of irrefragable logic and unforgettable fact john barleycorn will not let the dreamer dream the liver live he destroys birth and death and dissipates to mist the paradox of being until his victim cries out as in the city of dreadful night our life's a cheat our death a black abyss and the feet of the victim of such dreadful intimacy 
take hold of the way of death. End of chapter 35 Chapter 36 Back to personal experiences and the effects in the past of John Barleycorn's white logic on me. On my lovely ranch in the Valley of the Moon, brain soaked with many months of alcohol, I am oppressed by the cosmic sadness that has always been the heritage of man. In vain do I ask myself why I should be sad. My nights are warm, my roof does not leak. I have food galore for all the caprices of appetite. Every creature comfort is mine. In my body are no aches nor pains. The good old flesh machine is running smoothly on. Neither brain nor muscle is overworked. I have land, money, power, recognition from the world, a consciousness that I do my meed of good in serving others, a mate whom I love, children that are of my own fond flesh. I have done and am doing what a good citizen of the world should do. I have built houses, many houses, and tilled many a hundred acres. And as for trees, have I not planted a hundred thousand? Everywhere, from any window of my house, I can gaze forth upon these trees of my planting, standing valiantly erect and aspiring toward the sun. My life had indeed fallen in pleasant places. Not a hundred men in a million have been so lucky as I. Yet with all this vast good fortune am I sad. And I am sad because John Barleycorn is with me. And John Barleycorn is with me because I was born in what future ages will call the dark ages before the ages of rational civilization. John Barleycorn is with me because in all the unwitting days of my youth John Barleycorn was accessible calling to me and inviting me on every corner and on every street between the corners. The pseudo-civilization into which I was born permitted everywhere licensed shops for the sale of soul poison. The system of life was so organized that I, and millions like me, was lured and drawn and driven to the poison shops. Wonder with me through one mood of the myriad moods of sadness into which one is plunged by John Barleycorn. I ride out over my beautiful ranch. Between my legs is a beautiful horse. The air is wine. The grapes on a score of rolling hills are red with autumn flame. Across Sonoma Mountains, wisps of sea fog are stealing. The afternoon sun smolders in the drowsy sky. I have everything to make me glad I am alive. I am filled with dreams and mysteries. I am all sun and air and sparkle. I am vitalized, organic. I move. I have the power of movement. I command movement of the live thing I bestride. I am possessed with the pomps of being and know proud passions and inspirations. I have ten thousand august connotations. I am a king in the kingdom of sense, and trample the face of the uncomplaining dust. And yet, 
with jaundiced eye i gaze upon all the beauty and wonder about me and with jaundiced brain consider the pitiful figure i cut in this world that endured so long without me and that will again endure without me i remember the men who broke their hearts and their backs over this stubborn soil that now belongs to me as if anything imperishable could belong to the perishable these men passed i too shall pass these men toiled and cleared and planted gazed with aching eyes while they rested their labor-stiffened bodies on these same sunrises and sunsets at the autumn glory of the grape and at the fog wisps stealing across the mountain and they are gone and i know that i too shall some day and soon be gone gone i am going now in my jaw are cunning artifices of the dentists which replace the parts of me already gone never again will i have the thumbs of my youth old fights and wrestlings have injured them irreparably that punch on the head of a man whose very name is forgotten settled this thumb finally and forever a slip grip at catch as catch can did for the other my lean runner's stomach has passed into the limbo of memory the joints of the legs that bear me up are not so adequate as they once were when in wild nights and days of toil and frolic i strained and snapped and ruptured them never again can i swing dizzily aloft and trust all the proud quick that is i to a single rope clutch in the driving blackness of storm never again can i run with sled dogs along the endless miles of arctic trail i am aware that within the disintegrating body which has been dying since i was born i carry a skeleton that under the rind of flesh which is called my face is a bony noseless death's head all of which does not shudder me to be afraid is to be healthy fear of death makes for life but the curse of the white logic is that it does not make one afraid the world sickness of the white logic makes one grin jocosely into the face of the noseless one and to sneer at all the phantasmagoria of living i look about me as i ride and on every hand i see the merciless and infinite waste of natural selection the white logic insists upon opening the long closed books and by paragraph and chapter states the beauty and wonder i behold in terms of futility and dust about me is murmur and hum and i know it for the gnat swarm of the living piping for a little space its thin plaint of troubled air i return across the ranch twilight is on and the hunting animals are out i watch the piteous tragic play of life feeding on life here is no morality only in man is morality and man created it a code of action that makes toward living and that is of the lesser order of truth yet all this i knew before in the weary days of my long sickness these were the greater truths that i so successfully schooled myself to forget the truths that were so serious that i refused to take them seriously and played with gently oh so gently 
as sleeping dogs at the back of consciousness which I did not care to waken. I did but stir them and let them lie. I was too wise, too wicked wise, to wake them. But now white logic willy-nilly wakes them for me, for white logic, most valiant, is unafraid of all the monsters of the earthly dream. Let the doctors of all the schools condemn me, white logic whispers as I ride along. What of it? I am truth. You know it. You cannot combat me. They say I make for death. What of it? It is truth. Life lies in order to live. Life is a perpetual lie-telling process. Life is a mad dance in the domain of flux, wherein appearances in mighty tides ebb and flow, chained to the wheels of moons beyond our ken. Appearances are ghosts. Life is ghostland, where appearances change, transfuse, permeate each the other and all the others that are, that are not, that always flicker, fade, and pass, only to come again as new appearances, as other appearances. You are such an appearance, composed of countless appearances out of the past, all an appearance can know is mirage. You know mirages of desire. These very mirages are the unthinkable and incalculable conjuries of appearances that crowd in upon you and form you out of the past, and that sweep you on into dissemination into other unthinkable and incalculable conjuries of appearances to people the ghost land of the future. Life is apparitional and passes. You are an apparition. Through all the apparitions that preceded you and that composed the parts of you, you rose gibbering from the evolutionary mire, and gibbering you will pass on, interfusing, permeating the procession of apparitions that will succeed you. And, of course, it is all unanswerable. And as I ride along through the evening shadows, I sneer at that great fetish which Kant called the world. And I remember that another pessimist of sentiency has uttered, Transient are all. They, being born, must die, and being dead, are glad to be at rest. But here through the dusk comes one who is not glad to be at rest. He is a workman on the ranch, an old man, an immigrant Italian. He takes his hat off to me in all severity, because, forsooth, I am to him a lord of life. I am food to him and shelter and existence. He has toiled like a beast all his days, and lived less comfortably than my horses in their deep-strawed stalls. He is labor-crippled. He shambles as he walks. One shoulder is twisted higher than the other. His hands are gnarled claws, repulsive, horrible. As an apparition, he is a pretty miserable specimen. His brain is as stupid as his body is ugly. His brain is so stupid that he does not know that he is an apparition. The white logic chuckles to me. He is sense drunk. He is the slave of the dream of life. His brain is filled with super-rational sanctions and obsessions. He believes in a transcendent overworld. 
he has listened to the vagaries of the prophets who have given to him the sumptuous bubble of paradise. He feels inarticulate self-affinities with self-conjured non-realities. He sees penumbral visions of himself titubating fantastically through days and nights of space and stars. Beyond the shadow of any doubt, he is convinced that the universe was made for him and that it is his destiny to live forever in the immaterial and supersensuous realms he and his kind have builded of the stuff of semblance and deception. But you, who have opened the books and who share my awful confidence, you know him for what he is, brother to you and the dust, a cosmic joke a sort of chemistry, a garmented beast that arose out of the ruck of screaming beastliness by virtue and accident of two opposable great toes. He is brother as well to the gorilla and the chimpanzee. He thumps his chest in anger and roars and quivers with cataleptic ferocity. He knows monstrous atavistic promptings, and he is composed of all manner of shreds of abysmal and forgotten instincts. Yet he dreams he is immortal, I argue feebly. It is vastly wonderful for so stupid a clod to bestride the shoulders of time and ride the eternities. Pa is the retort. Would you then shut the books and exchange places with this thing that is only an appetite and a desire, a marionette of the belly and the loins? To be stupid is to be happy, I contend. Then your ideal of happiness is a jelly-like organism floating in a tideless, tepid twilight sea, eh? Oh, the victim cannot combat John Barleycorn. One step removed from the annihilating bliss of Buddha's nirvana, the white logic adds. Oh, well, here's the house. Cheer up and take a drink. We know we illuminated you and I all the folly and the farce. And in my book wall den, the mausoleum of the thoughts of men, I take my drink, and other drinks, and roust out the sleeping dogs from the recesses of my brain, and hallow them on over the walls of prejudice and law, and through all the cunning labyrinths of superstition and belief. Drink! says the white logic. The Greeks believed that the gods gave them wine so that they might forget the miserableness of existence. And remember what Hein said. Well do I remember that flaming Jews with the last breath all is done. Joy, love, sorrow, macaroni, the theatre, lime trees, raspberry drops, the power of human relations, gossip, the barking of dogs, champagne. Your clear white light is sickness, I tell the white logic. You lie. By telling too strong a truth, he quips back. Alas, yes, so topsy-turvy is existence, I acknowledge sadly. Ah, well, Liu Ling was wiser than you, the white logic girds. You remember him? I nod my head. Liu Ling, a hard drinker, one of the group of bibulous poets who called themselves the seven sages of the bamboo grove and who lived in china many an ancient century ago it was liu ling 
prompts the white logic, who declared that to a drunken man the affairs of this world appear but as much duckweed on a river. Very well. Have another scotch, and let semblance and deception become duckweed on a river. And while I pour and sip my scotch, I remember another Chinese philosopher, Shuang Tzu, who four centuries before Christ challenged this dreamland of the world, saying, How then do I know but that the dead repent of having previously clung to life? Those who dream of the banquet wake to lamentation and sorrow. Those who dream of lamentation and sorrow wake to join the hunt. While they dream, they do not know that they dream. Some will even interpret the very dream they are dreaming, and only when they awake do they know it was a dream. Fools think they are awake now, and flatter themselves they know if they are really princes or peasants. Confucius and you are both dreams, and I who say you are dreams, I am but a dream myself. Once upon a time I, Shuang Tzu, dreamt I was a butterfly, fluttering hither and thither, to all intents and purposes a butterfly. I was conscious only of following my fancies as a butterfly, and was unconscious of my individuality as a man. Suddenly I awaked, and there I lay myself again. Now I do not know whether I was then a man dreaming I was a butterfly, or whether I am now a butterfly dreaming I am a man. Chapter 37 Come, says the white logic, and forget those Asian dreamers of old time. Fill your glass and let us look at the parchments of the dreamers of yesterday who dreamed their dreams on your own warm hills. I pour over the abstract of title of the vineyard called Toque on the rancho called Petaluma. It is a sad long list of the names of men beginning with Manuel Michel Terreno, one-time Mexican governor, commander-in-chief, and inspector of the Department of the Californias, who deeded ten square leagues of stolen Indian land to Colonel Don Mariano Guadalupe Valhejo for services rendered his country and for monies paid by him for ten years to his soldiers. Immediately this musty record of man's land lust assumes the formidableness of a battle, the quick struggling with the dust. There are deeds of trust, mortgages, certificates of release, transfers, judgments, foreclosures, writ of attachment, orders of sale, tax liens, petitions for letters of administration, and decrees of distribution. It is like a monster ever unsubdued, this stubborn land that drowses in this Indian summer weather and that survives them all, the men who scratched its surface and passed. Who was this James King of William, so curiously named? The oldest surviving settler in the Valley of the Moon knows him not. 
yet only sixty years ago he loaned mariano g vallejo eighteen thousand dollars on security of certain lands including the vineyard yet to be and to be called tokay whence came peter o'connor and whither vanished after writing his little name of a day on the woodland that was to become a vineyard appears louis somociane a name to conjure with he lasts through several pages of this record of the enduring soil comes old american stock thirsting across the great american desert mule backing across the isthmus wind jamming around the horn to write brief and forgotten names where ten thousand generations of wild indians are equally forgotten names like halleck hastings sweat tate denman tracy grimwood carlton temple there are no names like those today in the valley of the moon the names begin to appear fast and furiously flashing from legal page to legal page and in a flash vanishing but ever the persistent soil remains for others to scrawl themselves across come the names of men of whom i have vaguely heard but whom i have never known kohler and froling who built the great stone winery on the vineyard called tokay but who built upon a hill up which other vineyardists refused to haul their grapes so kohler and froling lost the land the earthquake of nineteen hundred and six threw down the winery and i now live in its ruins la motte he broke the soil planted vines and orchards instituted commercial fish culture built a mansion renowned in its day was defeated by the soil and passed and my name of a day appears on the site of his orchards and vineyards of his proud mansion of his very fish ponds i have scrawled myself with half a hundred thousand eucalyptus trees cooper and greenlaw on what is called the hill ranch they left two of their dead little lily and little david who rest today inside a tiny square of hand-hewn palings also cooper and greenlaw in their time cleared the virgin forest from three fields of forty acres today i have those three fields sown with canada peas and in the spring they shall be ploughed under for green manure Haska a dim legendary figure of a generation ago who went back up the mountains and cleared six acres of brush in the tiny valley that took his name he broke the soil reared stone walls and a house and planted apple trees and already the site of the house is undiscoverable the location of the stone walls may be deduced from the configuration of the landscape and i am renewing the battle putting in angora goats to browse away the brush that has overrun haska's clearing and choked haska's apple trees to death so i too scratch the land with my brief endeavor and flash my name across a page of legal script ere i pass and the page grows musty dreamers and ghosts the white logic chuckles but surely the striving was not altogether vain i contend 
It was based on illusion and is a lie. A vital lie, I retort. And pray, what is a vital lie but a lie? The white logic challenges. Come, fill your glass and let us examine these vital liars who crowd your bookshelves. Let us dabble in William James a bit. A man of health, I say. From him we may expect no philosopher's stone, but at least we will find a few robust tonic things to which to tie. Rationality gelded to sentiment, the white logic grins. At the end of all his thinking, he still clung to the sentiment of immortality. Facts transmuted in the alembic of hope into terms of faith. The ripest fruit of reason, the stultification of reason. From the topmost peak of reason, James teaches to cease reasoning and to have faith that all is well and will be well. The old, oh, ancient old, acrobatic flip of the metaphysicians whereby they reasoned reason quite away in order to escape the pessimism consequent upon the grim and honest exercise of reason. Is this flesh of yours you? or is it an extraneous something possessed by you? Your body, what is it? A machine for converting stimuli into reactions. Stimuli and reactions are remembered. They constitute experience. Then you are in your consciousness these experiences. You are at any moment what you are thinking at that moment. Your I is both subject and object. It predicates things of itself and is the things predicated. The thinker is the thought, the knower is what is known, the possessor is the things possessed. After all, as you know well, man is a flux of states of consciousness, a flow of passing thoughts, each thought of self and other self, a myriad thoughts, a myriad selves, a continual becoming but never being, a will-of-the-wisp flitting of ghosts in ghostland. But this man will not accept of himself. He refuses to accept his own passing. He will not pass. He will live again if he has to die to do it. He shuffles atoms and jets of light, remotest nebulae, drips of water, prick points of sensation, slime oozings and cosmic bulks, all mixed with pearls of faith, love of woman, imagined dignities, frightened surmises, and pompous arrogances, and of the stuff builds himself an immortality to startle the heavens and baffle the immensities. He squirms on his dunghill, and like a child lost in the dark among goblins, calls to the gods that he is their younger brother, a prisoner of the quick that is destined to be as free as they, monuments of egotism reared by the epiphenomena, dreams and the dust of dreams, that vanish when the dreamer vanishes and are no more when he is not. It is nothing new, these vital lies men tell themselves, muttering and mumbling them like charms and incantations against the powers of night. 
the voodoos and medicine men and the devil-devil doctors were the fathers of metaphysics night and the noseless one were ogres that beset the way of light and life and the metaphysicians would win by if they had to tell lies to do it they were vexed by the brazen law of the ecclesiast that men die like the beasts of the field and their end is the same their creeds were their schemes their religions their nostrums their philosophies their devices by which they half believed they would outwit the noseless one and the night bog lights vapors of mysticism psychic overtones soul orgies wailings among the shadows weird gnosticisms veils and tissues of words gibbering subjectivisms gropings and maunderings ontological fantasies pan-psychic hallucinations this is the stuff the phantasms of hope that fills your bookshelves look at them all the sad wraiths of sad mad men and passionate rebels your schopenhauers your strindbergs your tolstoys and nietzsches come your glass is empty fill and forget i obey for my brain is now well a-crawl with the maggots of alcohol and as i drink to the sad thinkers on my shelves i quote richard hovey abstain not life and love like night and day offer themselves to us on their own terms not ours accept their bounty while ye may before we be accepted by the worms i will cap you cries the white logic no i answer while the maggots madden me i know you for what you are and i am unafraid under your mask of hedonism you are yourself the noseless one and your way leads to the night hedonism has no meaning it too is a lie at best the coward's smug compromise now i will cap you the white logic breaks in but if you would not this poor life fulfill lo you are free to end it when you will without the fear of waking after death and i laugh my defiance for now and for the moment i know the white logic to be the arch impostor of them all whispering his whispers of death and he is guilty of his own unmasking with his own genial chemistry turning the tables on himself with his own maggots biting alive the old illusions resurrecting and making to sound again the old voice from beyond of my youth telling me again that still are mine the possibilities and powers which life and the books had taught me did not exist and the dinner gong sounds to the reversed bottom of my glass jeering at the white logic i go out to join my guests at table and with assumed seriousness to discuss the current magazines and the silly doings of the world's day whipping every trick and ruse of controversy through all the paces of paradox and persiflage and when the whim changes it is most easy and delightfully disconcerting to play with the respectable and cowardly bourgeois fetishes and to laugh and epigram at the flitting god ghosts and the debaucheries and follies of wisdom the clown's the thing the clown if one must be a philosopher 
let him be Aristophanes. And no one at the table thinks I am jingled. I am in fine fettle, that is all. I tire of the labor of thinking, and when the table is finished, start practical jokes and set all playing at games which we carry on with bucolic boisterousness. And when the evening is over and good night said, I go back through my book-walled den to my sleeping porch and to myself and to the white logic which, undefeated, has never left me. And as I fall to fuddled sleep, I hear youth crying, as Harry Kemp heard it. I heard youth calling in the night, Gone is my former world delight, For there is not my feet may stay, The morn suffuses into day, It dare not stand a moment still, But must the world with light fulfill. More evanescent than the rose, my sudden rainbow comes and goes, plunging bright ends across the sky. Yea, I am youth, because I die. Chapter 38 The foregoing is a sample roaming with the white logic through the dusk of my soul. To the best of my power, I have striven to give the reader a glimpse of a man's secret dwelling when it is shared with John Barleycorn. And the reader must remember that this mood, which he has read in a quarter of an hour, is but one mood of the myriad moods of John Barleycorn, and that the procession of such moods may well last the clock around through many a day and week and month. My alcoholic reminiscences draw to a close. I can say, as any strong, chesty drinker can say, that all that leaves me alive today on the planet is my unmerited luck, the luck of chest and shoulders and constitution. I dare to say that a not large percentage of use in the formative stage of fifteen to seventeen could have survived the stress of heavy drinking that I survived between my fifteenth and seventeenth years. That a not large percentage of men could have punished the alcohol I have punished in my manhood years and lived to tell the tale. I survived through no personal virtue, but because I did not have the chemistry of a dipsomaniac and because I possessed an organism unusually resistant to the ravages of John Barleycorn. And, surviving, I have watched the others die, not so lucky, down all the long sad road. It was my unmitigated and absolute good fortune, good luck, chance, call it what you will, that brought me through the fires of John Barleycorn. My life, my career, my joy in living, have not been destroyed. They have been scorched, it is true, like the survivors of forlorn hopes. They have, by unthinkably miraculous ways, come through the fight to marvel at the tally of the slain. And like such a survivor of old red war who cries out, Let there be no more war, so I cry out, Let there be no more poison fighting by our youths. The way to stop war is to stop it. The way to stop drinking is to stop it. The way China stopped the general use of opium was by stopping the cultivation and importation of opium. 
the philosophers, priests, and doctors of China could have preached themselves breathless against opium for a thousand years, and the use of opium, so long as opium was ever accessible and obtainable, would have continued unabated. We are so made, that is all. We have, with great success, made a practice of not leaving arsenic and strychnine and typhoid and tuberculosis germs lying around for our children to be destroyed by. Treat John Barleycorn the same way. Stop him. Don't let him lie around, licensed and legal, to pounce upon our youth. Not of alcoholics, nor for alcoholics do I write, but for our youths, for those who possess no more than the adventure stings and the genial predispositions, the social man impulses, which are twisted all awry by our barbarian civilization which feeds them poison on all the corners. It is the healthy, normal boys, now born or being born, for whom I write. It was for this reason, more than any other, and more ardently than any other, that I rode down into the valley of the moon, all a jingle, and voted for equal suffrage. I voted that women might vote because I knew that they, the wives and mothers of the race, would vote John Barleycorn out of existence and back into the historical limbo of our vanished customs of savagery. If I thus seem to cry out as one hurt, please remember that I have been sorely bruised and that I do dislike the thought that any son or daughter of mine or yours should be similarly bruised. The women are the true conservators of the race. The men are the wastrels, the adventure lovers and gamblers, and in the end it is by their women that they are saved. About man's first experiment in chemistry was the making of alcohol, and down all the generations to this day man has continued to manufacture and drink it. And there has never been a day when the women have not resented man's use of alcohol, though they have never had the power to give weight to their resentment. The moment women get the vote in any community, the first thing they proceed to do is to close the saloons. In a thousand generations to come, men of themselves will not close the saloons. As well expect the morphine victims to legislate the sale of morphine out of existence. The women know. They have paid an incalculable price of sweat and tears for man's use of alcohol. Ever jealous for the race, they will legislate for the babes of boys yet to be born, and for the babes of girls too, for they must be the mothers, wives, and sisters of these boys. And it will be easy. The only ones that will be hurt will be the topers and seasoned drinkers of a single generation. I am one of these, and I make solemn assurance, based upon long traffic with John Barleycorn, that it won't hurt me very much to stop drinking when no one else drinks, and when no drink is obtainable. On the other hand, the overwhelming proportion of young men are so normally non-alcoholic that, never having had access to alcohol, they will never miss it. 
they will know of the saloon only in the pages of history and they will think of the saloon as a quaint old custom similar to bull-baiting and the burning of witches chapter thirty nine of course no personal tale is complete without bringing the narrative of the person down to the last moment but mine is no tale of a reformed drunkard i was never a drunkard and i have not reformed it chanced some time ago that i made a voyage of one hundred and forty-eight days in a wind-jammer around the horn i took no private supply of alcohol along and though there was no day of those one hundred and forty-eight days that i could not have got a drink from the captain i did not take a drink i did not take a drink because i did not desire a drink no one else drank on board the atmosphere for drinking was not present and in my system there was no organic need for alcohol my chemistry did not demand alcohol so there arose before me a problem a clear and simple problem this is so easy why not keep it up when you get back on land i weighed this problem carefully i waited for five months in a state of absolute non-contact with alcohol and out of the data of past experience i reached certain conclusions in the first place i am convinced that not one man in ten thousand or in a hundred thousand is a genuine chemical dipsomaniac drinking as i deem it is practically entirely a habit of mind it is unlike tobacco or cocaine or morphine or all the rest of the long list of drugs the desire for alcohol is quite peculiarly mental in its origin it is a matter of mental training and growth and it is cultivated in social soil not one drinker in a million began drinking alone all drinkers began socially and this drinking is accompanied by a thousand social connotations such as i have described out of my own experience in the first part of this narrative these social connotations are the stuff of which the drink habit is largely composed the part that alcohol itself plays is inconsiderable when compared with the part played by the social atmosphere in which it is drunk the human is rarely born these days who without long training in the social associations of drinking feels the irresistible chemical propulsion of his system toward alcohol i do assume that such rare individuals are born but i have never encountered one on this long five months voyage i found that among all my bodily needs not the slightest shred of a bodily need for alcohol existed but this i did find my need was mental and social when i thought of alcohol the connotation was fellowship when i thought of fellowship the connotation was alcohol fellowship and alcohol were siamese twins they always occurred linked together thus when reading in my deck chair or when talking with others practically any mention of any part of the world i knew instantly aroused the connotation of drinking and good fellows big nights and days and moments all purple passages and freedoms thronged my memory venice stares at me from the printed page 
and I remember the cafe tables on the sidewalks. The Battle of Santiago, someone says, and I answer, Yes, I've been over the ground. But I do not see the ground, nor Kettle Hill, nor the Peace Tree. What I see is the Café Venus, on the Plaza of Santiago, where one hot night I drank and talked with a dying consumptive. The East End of London, I read, or someone says, and first of all, under my eyelids, leap the visions of the shining pubs, and in my ears echo the calls for two of bitter and three of scotch. The Latin Quarter, at once I am in the student cabarets, bright faces and keen spirits around me, sipping cool, well-dripped absinthe, while our voices mount and soar in Latin fashion as we settle God and art and democracy and the rest of the simple problems of existence. In a pampero off the river plot we speculate, if we are disabled, of running into Buenos Aires, the Paris of America, and I have visions of bright congregating places of men, of the jollity of raised glasses, and of song and cheer and the hum of genial voices. When we have picked up the northeast trades in the Pacific, we try to persuade our dying captain to run for Honolulu, and while I persuade, I see myself again drinking cocktails on the cool lane and fizzes out at Waikiki where the surf rolls in. Someone mentions the way wild ducks are cooked in the restaurants of San Francisco, and at once I am transported to the light and clatter of many tables, where I gaze at old friends across the golden brims of long-stemmed Rhine wine glasses. And so I pondered my problem. I should not care to revisit all those fair places of the world except in the fashion I visited them before, glass in hand. There is a magic in the phrase. It means more than all the words in the dictionary can be made to mean. It is a habit of mind to which I have been trained all my life. It is now part of the stuff that composes me. I like the bubbling play of wit, the chesty laughs, the resonant voices of men when, glass in hand, they shut the gray world outside and prod their brains with the fun and folly of an accelerated pulse. No, I decided, I shall take my drink on occasion. With all the books on my shelves, with all the thoughts of the thinkers shaded by my particular temperament, I decided coolly and deliberately that I should continue to do what I had been trained to want to do. I would drink. But, oh, more skillfully, more discreetly than ever before. Never again would I be a peripatetic conflagration. Never again would I invoke the white logic. I had learned how not to invoke him. The white logic now lies decently buried alongside the long sickness. Neither will afflict me again. It is many a year since I laid the long sickness away. His sleep is sound. 
and just as sound is the sleep of the white logic. And yet, in conclusion, I can well say that I wish my forefathers had banished John Barleycorn before my time. I regret that John Barleycorn flourished everywhere in the system of society in which I was born, else I should not have made his acquaintance, and I was long trained in his acquaintance. End of chapter 39 Recorded by Peter Kelleher Eastport Medway, Nova Scotia.